Hello, I'm, I'm happy to share with you some of our latest results and uh, also some of our plans for the next year. I'm sitting in front of uh, our equipment setup for the nano needle assay. The nano needle um, is made by uh, a nanofabrication process. Um, it's the size of it is in nanometers, and the nanometers are very small. You cannot see it with the naked eye. Uh, the needle itself, uh, you can't even see it really with a light, a light microscope. You have to use an electron microscope to see it. So it's very, very tiny. And it is able to carry an electrical current. And we used uh, 2,500 of these little nano needles uh, in, in the blood, uh, each of them being measured um, uh, 200 times a second. Um, so this is something that gives us a, a very nice measurement. And what we find is if we put in the, uh, the blood, uh, it, it gives us a constant uh, measurement of electrical impedance, and that's just a property of electrical property uh, that one can measure. And it looks the same as a healthy control. But if we put in a little bit of salt, uh, the healthy control does not change, but the CFS patients gradually increase impedance over time. And uh, that's, what's, that's what's very consistent. In fact, it gives a very unique signature where it first decreases and then increases. And so that, looking at that signature, we can easily say, just looking at it, say, yep, that's a, that's a CFS patient. But first I'd like to talk a little bit about our continued progress on our uh, severely ill patient study. Uh, there's a lot of data that we collected, so it's taking a long time to uh, analyze it all. Uh, we have a small staff that goes through the, all of the data, um, uh, and it's an enormous uh, undertaking. But we're slowly uh, pulling things together. Um, one of the things that we're seeing in the genetics, and that's from the sequencing, uh, is there's a lot of uh, gene alterations uh, that seem to be coming up with higher frequency uh, in these patients than in the, uh, in the healthy population. Uh, this is just too small of a study of 20 uh, to make a big deal about that. I'm not going to talk about the particular genes. Uh, in general, uh, but we need to get it validated with a larger uh, study, which I think will happen uh, next year. Uh, we do find some interesting things, however. Uh, one is uh, in, a, in a locus that's involved in uh, infection, and that's the Kerr locus. And uh, I'm not going to show you the data for that, but th there's some unusual features in that that we wanted to explore more thoroughly. Uh, that could turn out to be quite useful. In our, in our analysis. Um, the other thing that has, and I've talked about this before, but it's still surprising to me, is, is that we can't find an infectious organism. Uh, I thought we would find viruses uh, pretty commonly in these severely ill patients, and we don't. Uh, we, in fact, find it more frequent in a healthy population than in the, in the patient population. Um, we're going to continue to look. We have some new ideas. There's some new technologies out there um, that we can look even maybe deeper. We are excited that this now has been shown that, if, in fact, if there's an infection anywhere of any type of organism, the DNA from that organism eventually gets in the blood. And so we're going to do some big analysis on the blood looking for any kind of pathogen. Uh, I wanted to specifically uh, sit here in front of this instrument so you get an idea of what it's like. Um, typical when you develop a new technology, you have a whole host of problems and you have to then troubleshoot and figure them out. And uh, this has no, been no different and you might say, gee, this is, seems to be slow. Yes, it is slow. It's always slow in the very first phase um, because you'll run into uh, one problem after another and you have to figure out a solution for those. And uh, we've had a lot of uh, manufacturing problems. Uh, we've had problems with hiring other people to make them and not doing a good job. Um, we've also had uh, issues about how the blood is processed. Uh, that's, helped, that's caused us a great deal of uh, anguish, actually, when we've gone to other people and they've sent us samples. And in fact, uh, those samples aren't collected the same way and so we can't really use them. And so we're getting a handle on all that and trying to be, uh, and writing up protocols and getting it standardized. 
Um, I, I think for the nanoneedle, uh, we have figured out exactly how to prepare the blood uh, and get it reproducible. We've also found that we can keep the blood for quite a while at room temperature and have it still give us good signal and that's incredibly helpful to us so that we don't have to process it instantly. In the case of my son, sometimes we get them very late at night and that means working all night to do the analysis. Uh, but this is the instrument and this is a, a new uh, what's called probe station. Uh, this particular one it's set up now can do two chips simultaneously. That's actually quite useful for the science because it means that we can do a healthy control along with the patient or it means we can do a, a patient sample uh, with and without a particular drug. So those are the studies that are going to start, uh, start next. Um, this uh, instrument was purchased with the donations from uh, uh, the Open Medicine Foundation. Uh, it's been extremely helpful. This will help speed us up. Um, we're a little upset because there's nothing commercially available that actually would uh, be exactly what we need. Uh, because this is only doing two, we really need to do a large number. So we, in planning stages, working out something that we will probably have to build ourselves uh, that will allow us to do a very large number. Uh, uh, it would be great to get some commercial partner to do that because that, uh, it would greatly help us and anybody else using the technology. What we found with this now is that uh, we've looked at, I believe now, 11 patients uh, and uh, 10 healthy controls. We're going to do more healthy controls. But we get an absolute uh, consistency now. Every patient shows the signals that we see, the increase in impedance of the electrical circuit uh, when we add salt. None of the healthy controls do that. I think we have to publish, and so I think we're going to stop very soon here and at least publish the first paper to show what we're doing. Uh, uh, we've been slow to publish mostly because we've been uh, understaffed, and uh, we always want to collect more data and uh, put the publication off and we have to stop doing that. We're going to have to put stuff together and now publish. Uh, but this is very exciting uh, because uh, uh, there's something going on. Now the problem we have with this technology is that we don't really understand what's causing the measurement at the biochemistry medical level. And we really feel we should try to look into what is actually causing this. Uh, and I, and we, since we have no good idea, it's going to take a bit of probing to figure it out. The reason to do that is that it, having something so unique that every patient shows it, and none of the healthy controls do, uh, there's something going on in the blood of patients. And maybe it'll be a, a clue as to what is also happening at the medical level that people have missed in the past. So we're going to try to track that down. It's also possible that it could lead to some treatment. Uh, it might only be a treatment of uh, some symptom, but it would be something that we would be a positive thing for the patients. Now, we are also developing, uh, as a collaboration, another instrument to look at blood flow um, because it's something that could be affected. Uh, blood from CFS patients seems a little strange. It seems a little sticky. Uh, it just it looks like a little different color. There's something different about the blood and we'd like to sort of sort that out. So we, get, we have some early positive results that there's a difference in blood flow um, and mostly the rate at which red cells go through the little capillaries. Now these capillaries are manufactured capillaries, they're not capillaries on a person. Uh, but that's going to be augmented uh, in terms of trying out of these combinations of these technologies. So we're very dedicated to trying to find a very simple biomarker. Uh, this might be it, we're not sure it is yet, uh, but we do have a lot of experience at taking things from the laboratory into clinical practice. We've done that several times. Um, uh, we have an assay for uh, cystic fibrosis that is now, uh, uh, was initially at just at Stanford, is now uh, in, in California being used to diagnose it. Uh, we have also in testing a, a number of things for a, a lot of childhood diseases or newborns. Uh, and that's technically very difficult to do. You have to do an awful lot of work to make sure everything is valid. 
So that experience is going to help us in this too. We know exactly what we're going to have to do to get this as a diagnostic marker. Uh, but I'm not going to show you any of the data uh, because I don't think it means that much, it's, but it's a very clear signal. One of the things to keep in mind is an awful lot of um, biochemical assays and medical assays measure one point. They, may, they make one measurement and you get a number. And you always worry about, well, what if I did it again? But I get the same number. Uh, the way this technology is run is that we take uh, many, many, many uh, measurements along the course of the experiment. So by the time the experiment's over, we've done about a, mil a billion measurements. So the possibility that it's the wrong number is not going to be for the instrumentation. It would be because the blood wasn't handled properly or, in fact, something's happening to the patient. So it, it, I'm hoping it will give us a, a test that has very, very low uh, false negative, false positives. And that's a real serious problem in the, uh, in the diagnostic industry at the moment. With the funding from OMF for the next year, uh, we'll certainly finish up uh, doing these kinds of measurements. But what, the, what this technology tells us is the difference between uh, CFS, ME-CFS patients and healthy controls. Now that's probably the most important thing to, to do. What we uh, would also like to do though is to distinguish it from other diseases and that is a, a little bit more difficult and, uh, and that's because uh, why would we do that? And the, the major reason why you would do that is because treatment uh, would be different. So what you're really interested in is uh, distinguish it from patients where they have a very clear difference that we know does not work on ME-CFS patients. For example, some of the biochemistry that's going on well, looks a little bit like diabetes. There's certainly a met metabolic signatures going on. And in fact, I've talked with one physician who's trying uh, metformin, which is a drug we use for, uh, uh, for diabetes. We don't know the results of that yet. But what we have to do is make sure that the, tr the that the treatment that you're going to, to use uh, um, is why you're doing the diagnosis. And so I think initially it's just going to be uh, patient versus healthy controls. We would like to see what kind of signature we get from other, from other diseases. Uh, is this really unique to MACFS? Uh, and we'll do fibromyalgia, we'll do Lyme's disease, um, we'll do MS, we'll do some other autoimmune diseases, we'll probably do diabetes uh, and see what kind of a signature we get. This whole thing started uh, uh, by um, noticing that if we have a, a bacterial culture, some bacteria, usually we work with E. coli, uh, or we have uh, some tumor cells isolated from a patient, and we use a drug that will kill those cells, and we put it in this device, what we see is if the cells are reacting to the drug, in other words, they're going to die, then we get an increase in impedance. And that's what made us look at the uh, MECFS uh, patient samples. And we thought that maybe if we added salt, sodium chloride, uh, that it would put a stress on the cell and we would see a signature, and in fact we do. But we don't know uh, uh, what's, what's happening to the cells. Uh, we don't have any evidence that they're dying. Something else seems to be going on. I, I would. Uh, also really like to thank the Open Medicine Foundation for their contributions. I would also like to thank all the donors uh, that made all of this possible. And i also like to thank uh, all of the patients who have been encouraging and positive and, uh, and helpful when we've asked for help. And we've had a stream of patients coming in and giving uh, blood samples, which have been absolutely critical for us to, to move forward. Thank you.